Thank you, Adam. Uh, good evening. Uh, well, I, I was going to ask, first of all, uh, if you could raise your hands, anybody here who knew Sarah Catherine Irish, uh, or, or back here we have, just looks like only looks like only a couple of people here tonight that knew her. Okay. Well, in 1975, when I started Pasadena Film Forum, and I ran Film Forum in, through 1983, uh, we had a great little community of filmmakers, a number of whom lived in the Pasadena area. And one of those was Sari. We call her Sari. I'll refer to her as Sari throughout my little dis discussion here. Uh, but uh, in 1975, late 1975, Bill Moritz, who was a teacher at Art Center College of Design, a well-known filmmaker and film historian, called me up and said, hey, do you know that there's an early experimental filmmaker living in Pasadena? Her name is Sarah Catherine Arledge. And I hadn't, honestly hadn't heard of her. So uh, he said, you might want to you know, go, go visit, pay her a visit and uh, see if she might be interested in showing her films at Film Forum. So I did a little research on her and uh, called her up. Turns out she lived just maybe a half a mile from, from where I was and, and made her acquaintance and we became very, very good friends. And uh, uh, you know, I, I actually, over the next five or six years, whenever she needed to show her films to somebody or her glass slide transparency, she often called me to come over and project those for her. Uh, so uh, we became really good friends. And uh, in 1976, we did the first screening of her films. And at that time, I was, I think, 22 years old. I made the worst programming decision of my <laughs> life. I don't think I ever mentioned this to, to Adam, but uh, I was very interested because Arledge's film, Introspection, which you're gonna see in a few minutes, uh, probably her landmark film, her most, most well-known film, was screened originally in 1947, a year after it was completed uh, in San Francisco at the San Francisco Museum of Art. There was a film series there called Art and Cinema, which was started by a, a filmmaker in the Bay Area and historian, a guy named Frank Stoffaker. Very famous film series. It was, it was the first kind of organized uh, screening of experimental films on the West Coast. There have been books written about this series, very, very prominent. And Arledge's film, Introspection, which as you'll see is about six minutes in length, was screened at that program. So I knew about this and I asked Sari, I said, hey, let's recreate the program you did in 1947, uh, and you can come out and afterwards and talk about that. Uh, well, the way Stoffaker did it very often is he'd screen a longer film, sometimes a European film or you know uh, uh, something that was an earlier film, and he'd show a short with it. And so we we showed uh, Sari's film along with about a two-hour Russian film from the 1930s, <laughs> which it was not Eisenstein, it was not Vertov, I think it was Dovshenko. It was the most tedious film <laughs> imaginable. And, but that was the film that was shown, so that was shown, and then Arledge's introspection was shown. So <laughs> we, we had an audience that really struggled for about two hours. Finally, we showed introspection, and Sari came out and spoke about her film. Mm -hmm. So that was 1976. In 1978, we had an exhibit of series of paintings at Film Forum at Arnon Gallery. We subleased the back space and we showed her films there. What is a Man, which you will see tonight, which was completed in 1958, was shown publicly for the first time that night, 20 years after it was completed. So Arledge's films, with the exception of introspection, never really got much in the way of screenings. To go back one second to introspection, uh, when that was screened in 1947 at Art and Cinema, uh, Arledge, you know, she never really was comfortable appearing with her films publicly, early on at least. By the 70s, she got more comfortable speaking about her work. But she did tell me that the night that it was screened at uh, Art and Cinema with this 
god-awful Russian film. Uh, she spent most of the night in, in the bathroom vomiting at the San Francisco <laughs> Museum of Art. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I'll conclude by just saying that uh, we later, uh, in, in Seri passed away in 1998, was living in Northern California at the time, and uh, we were very concerned about uh, her films and her artwork. And it was all in a storage unit up in Northern California. At this time, she had a conservator, and she was living under some uh, governmental assistance. And the storage unit that all this material was in, uh, they were basically being, they were paying for that storage unit out of whatever finances she had remaining. We had contacted the conservator, my wife and I, and said, look, uh, if the, the material in this storage unit is very historically important, and uh, if the time comes where that money runs out, let us know and we'll pick up the, the tab uh, on the storage unit because we don't want to have that work lost. And they agreed to that. Uh, the problem had occurred where they were changing conservators and our uh, paperwork was lost. So we followed up on it at a later date and there was a new conservator that became involved and uh, they said, we're really glad you contacted us because in about a week we were going to uh, mm -hmm. have a junk dealer come in mm -hmm. and all of the work inside was going to basically be tossed into a dumpster. So my wife and I got on the stick right away and we hired an attorney and we set up a trust to preserve her work uh, and, and also to continue paying for the storage unit. Uh, once the word got out to her family members who never took any interest in her work, were totally disengaged with, with her, once the word got out that we were interested in starting this trust to preserve her work, they became very interested, thinking that there was a, you know, some some financial uh, rewards that they were going to get from this. So we had to have an, a a conservator uh, or an appraiser, right? I, I, an appraiser come in and appraise her work. Uh, and of course. Uh, my wife and I were hoping the value would be low. An appraiser came in, looked around in the storage unit, saw the films, looked at the paintings. There were about 200 paintings, of which about 80 of them are in the show uh, in Pasadena now. And this is her life, her, her life's body of work. Uh, you know, and, and uh, so the appraiser came in, looked at everything, uh, went online, looked at, you know, what was she in any shows? Well, she wasn't in many shows because she she really never showed her work. Uh, and then the appraiser came back and appraised her entire life's work at one thousand eight hundred dollars, <laughs> <laughs> which Sari, had she been alive, would have gotten quite a kick out of it, hearing that. And 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 of course, for us, it was great news because her family then was no longer interested in the work. <laughs> we were able to set up the trust. But the reason why I mention that is because literally it was about a week uh, from being uh, oh thrown into a dumpster. And all of these films, her paintings, etc. I'm sure this is a story that's happened with other artists over the years uh, and, and, and we just don't hear about that. But uh, anyway, uh, I guess that's about it. We're going to look at introspection. I'm excited because all of the film work that uh, you'll see tonight, all of her films we donated to the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley. And uh, one of the projects they had mentioned over the years that they wanted to do was to make a really nice print of introspection. And I believe that's what we're seeing tonight. So I'm really excited to see uh, a print of this film uh, that was done in the 1940s. So uh, we'll see you at the end of the program, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Join me in welcoming uh, the curator of the exhibition, Serene for the Moment, at the Ornery Center of the Arts. Uh, and the, I guess I'll give you a title. Oh. The uh, director of exhibition programs there, uh, Irene Sato.
And thanks to Film Forum, thanks to Adam and to Film Forum for, um, for, for hosting the screening and organizing it tonight. The films that we're seeing are all in the exhibition <coughs> at the Armory, but it is, um, it's really amazing to be able to see it, you know, see all the works all together in this, in this format. It's never ideal to see films in an exhibition format, even though, you know, it's a convention of exhibition programming. Um, so just a little bit about the Arledge exhibition. It, um, it, has been in, it had been in the works for quite a long time. I was trying to remember, Terry and Mary, when I first met you to look at Arledge's work, and I think it was around 2012 or 2013. And for years, the only things that I had seen were the works on paper. Um, it wasn't until a number of years later that I traveled to the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archives and saw the work um, saw the film work as well. So on the basis of the works on paper alone, I was very drawn to this artist. Um, the works in the exhibition range from the 1930s when she was in her 20s to um, the 1970s or 80s. She left many of the works undated, many of them untitled, some of them with unclear orientation. Mm. <laughs> so the trust has been really instrumental, not just in saving the work from the dumpster, but also helping to um, you know, identify what it is um, and when it was made in some cases. And one thing that I wanted to speak to that maybe will come up later and that you can talk about more, Terry, as well, four of the seven films that we're seeing tonight, the seven films that we're seeing are the seven that we're aware that she made. She did leave storyboards for additional films that were never produced. It's been a fantasy of mine to commission an artist to actually interpret those storyboards into some kind of new film or performance or something. And some of those storyboards are on display at the Armory right now. But four of the films that we're seeing, including um, Tender Images 2, was screening when we walked in. Our, um, our um, films that sequence um, a selection of the hand-painted glass <coughs> transparencies she made. So she made works on paper, she made films, she wrote a lot, and she also did these paintings on um, glass transparencies about that size, like about three and a quarter by four inches or so. And she started doing this in the 1940s when she found these um, glass slides in a teaching aid store. I think they were mainly used for scientific purposes. And she used uh, different techniques to create, to make marks on these slides. And sometimes would use um, markers and like scratch into ink with um, Q-tips or, or um, toothpicks. Or she would cut up pieces of colored gel and lay them on the glass and then put another piece over it and melt it like a shrinky dink in the <laughs> oven and then tape up the edges. So these things were cumbersome. They were large. They were fragile. They were incredibly beautiful. And that's part of what was also donated to the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive along with the films and along with a lot of Arledge's archival material by, by the trust. Um, so the trust retained the works on paper and all the rest of that material went to went to the Berkeley Art Museum. So knowing how um, fragile and cumbersome these slides were, Arledge uh, made four films that sequenced them. And that's also part of what's in the exhibition right now. And that's what we're seeing here, just to clarify that. And you know, I guess probably four of us in the room maybe <laughs> saw those glass transparencies projected. She had this. Um, <coughs> customized in a way that I don't understand how it was customized <coughs> slide projector that was meant to show to show these things and when I was up on one of my trips to Berkeley it was complete serendipity that that I was there on a day that the museum was testing the projector with her slides so I was able to see these projected and <coughs> the the effect of um, looking at a large format slide um, projected across the room. It's kind of like when you look in a microscope and you're holding up the slide, the, the, what is it called? Yeah, like the slide that you're, that you're going to look at through the microscope. It doesn't look like it has the kind of density or depth that it does until you look at it through the microscope. Mm -hmm. So these slides were kind of like that only scaled up. You know, they're, they're in the projector being projected in this room and the depth of, um, 
the images was just astonishing. It was just absolutely stunning. And um, so it's really incredible to see these. And it, it's, 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 it's an interesting, I don't know how to even describe it. Like a, it's, a, it's just a different kind of thing than the slides, you know, themselves, but also really quite marvelous to see. So um, one other thing about the, the works on paper that are in the exhibition, you know, Arledge didn't, um, there wasn't a really clear kind of um, continuity, I guess you could say, stylistically in her um, practice in terms of her works on paper. Mm -hmm. it, it, there are things that you can see from the very earliest drawings that turn up again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I could continue later. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> there are things in the very earliest drawings that turn up decades later, you know, mark certain ways of making marks, certain um, sort of shapes, and, and you know, you can see that. You, you can sort of start to pick out a continuity, but it's really interesting to look at the slides that we'll be seeing more of because there's a vocabulary there that really emerges and that, that is also rendered in these works on paper as well. So anyway, more, it, it, yeah, more on that all later. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you very much. Can I ask you a question, Adam, before they start? Sure. Berkeley uh, PFAs restored a number of the films. Did they not restore What is a Man or was it not possible to get a pick from them? The only one Mona mentioned to me was introspection. Really? Yeah. Yeah, the, the original printing materials on what is a man don't exist. Uh, so what, what we found in Arledge's storage unit that was donated to Pacific Film Archive were just some prints. So they have a print of what is a man that I think is, is better than what you saw tonight. The print tonight was from Canyon. Yeah. yeah, rented from Canyon Cinema. So, uh, what they have a, a one really good, pretty good quality print. Uh, so I don't know what they're going to do with that. Whether they'll eventually create a new print struck from that, mm -hmm. but the original print materials mm. uh, are gone from that film. So, uh, you know, uh, and that's just that's just. Uh, the way it is on that. I, I was going to mention, because you had talked a little bit about the slides, yeah. the, uh, the uh, slides that are done in color, most of those were done from about 1947 to 1950, when Arledge worked at the College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland. And uh, the, base of, the basis of most of those slides were colored gels that she used in the making of introspection. Uh, and she would place them over the lights initially. And then uh, John Whitney told her, we, you don't need to place these gels over the lights, just place them over the camera lens, which she did. But she had bought a huge number of these colored gels. And being a thrifty person who always wanted to make use of these things, she decided that she would use these on the slides. So she would cut them up and layer them on the, uh, you know, these little glass slides and then uh, bake them in an oven and then she'd bring them out and then she would scratch on them and draw on them with magic markers and use uh, toilet paper to, you know, just all kinds of materials. Uh, and, and then she stopped doing the slides after 1950. Then in the 1970s, right around the time Mary and I met her, she picked up the, uh, doing the slides again and those are the ones that you saw in black and white or sepia. Unfortunately, the print doesn't really show the sepia quality too much. But so a lot of those slides were done with, um, she used a lot of soot and she would layer the glass slide with soot and then she would draw on that, bake it, scratch on it. Uh, and then when she got the little painting that she, little glass painting she liked, she would put the other, and it was dry, she would put the other glass piece on top of it, seal it, and then project it. And as you had mentioned, unfortunately, the films uh, don't really do justice to the glass slides as they're projected. I think Arledge was 
uh, it was impossible really unless you had the projector and the slide itself to, to be able to show these. The slides were very fragile, couldn't be shipped around like a film could. So these were an attempt for her to document the slides and show them um, and, and give you some sense as to what she was kind of working with there. It was a unique, uh, it was a unique uh, uh, medium, something that she had actually invented herself and uh, maybe her most successful medium as originally projected. Well, and it's also interesting to look at those slides and all of this together um, in light of her really lifelong interest in um, attempting to what she called add time to painting. And so you can probably talk more about the, um, the early influence of a performance that she saw at the Pasadena Playhouse by, um, what was his name, Wilfred? Thomas Wilfred. Thomas yeah. Wilfred, who had this um, device called a uh, clavalox, which um, I've understood as uh, something like an organ, but it didn't generate sound, it generated light. And she was a young, she was in her, a teenager and saw a performance, it, you know, of this clavalox and which I was just, I just learned, I haven't seen it, but I've, there's a video of a Clavalox performance at LACMA now, uh, I think in the permanent sure. collection. Anyway, I've heard that it's playing there, but. Um, it's not there anymore, but it's called a color organ that projects color. Yes. It's play and projects color. Yeah, it's not, at La it's not up right now. I heard it, it wasn't. Oh. Uh, it, was, it, it was up for several years, two yeah. years, but yeah. I mean, they took it down. They did, yeah, in the yeah. move and everything. Um, I remember seeing it. Yeah. So um, that was a very, she's written about that, and it was a very, um, it had a big influence on her, seeing this uh, performance as a teenager. And her film efforts and her works on paper were really inspired by this desire to add time to painting, and the slides as well. Mm -hmm. So a kind <coughs> of quixotic, I suppose, in a way, um, endeavor, but also a lifelong um, pursuit. Uh, questions as well? I we'll have a couple as well. well. Let me, you mentioned earlier one another person we lost this month was Barbara Hammer. Yeah. And you had an anecdote regarding yeah. Barbara it's Hammer and Arlo. Yeah. yeah uh, I don't know how many of you were familiar with the work of Barbara. Very uh, important uh, uh, lesbian and feminist filmmaker who began working in the 1970s and came to some prominence in the latter 70s and, and early 80s, mid 80s, and, and Barbara uh, came down to Pasadena and did one of her first early programs at Pasadena Film Forum in about 1978 and met Arledge at that time. And Arledge and her hit it off really well and uh, Barbara was very impressed to meet her, to see this early work that she had done in the 1940s and 50s, very, very much pioneering work, uh, and uh, took a special interest in Sari, wrote about her work for a publication in San Francisco called Cinema News, and promoted her work most importantly. You have to realize Arledge, in, with the exception of the film forum screenings in the 1970s, was, was very much unknown. Nobody knew about her work. Uh, and very little had been written about it. So Barbara was really important in uh, uh, in promoting her work and getting some screenings for her around the country. And of course, I I remember uh, Arledge uh, mentioning to me. She said uh, she was kind of curious as to why these feminist filmmakers were taking an interest in her work and she could, because she always used to say, I love men. <laughs> and, and I said, look, I said, the important thing is uh, your work is being shown and there's a, a, a new generation of, of uh, you know, film, people who love film who are seeing your work for the first time and it doesn't really matter who's promoting it. The fact of the matter is you're, you're getting some exposure for your work and so, uh, uh, I, I was fortunate Adam and Kate Lane invited me and Mary to uh, a screening of Barbara's films here in Los Angeles yeah. in November of last year 
uh, just a few months before she passed, and and uh, it was great to to see her again, and uh, uh, we talked to her briefly about her uh, relationship with Arledge, and and uh, so that we were very sad to, to hear of her passing, and and. Uh, Oh. Yeah. A lot of important icons who's leaving us. Uh, any other questions on any of the range of stuff? Yeah, Cindy. Do you know if there's any connection that she ever crossed paths with Charles Dockham? Charles Dockham had a studio in Altadena. He built a number of models of a color organ, the mobile color. He gave performances around Pasadena. Do you I'm know if she ever saw I any? Never, I never heard her mention him, and she definitely never wrote about him. So I, I don't know. Uh, uh, when was that happening? 50s through very early 70s. So that was during? Uh, uh, possibly late 40s. I can't recall when he moved there. Yeah, she never mentioned uh, that. That's also when she was away. Yeah. She, she In the she, 50s, she spent a lot of the 1950s out of Pasadena. What is a Man, which was started in 1951 and completed in 1958, for a good chunk of that decade she was at the Napa State Mental Institution, mm -hmm. Mental Hospital, where she was institutionalized and diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, her husband had her uh, placed there and she underwent uh, approximately 30 electroshock treatments during that time period. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, so I, she was not really in Pasadena at that in the 50s, but I, I don't never remember her mentioning what that. What did she live in Pasadena? Well, she was in Pasadena as a, as a child. The house she lived in Pasadena on Rose Villa was built by her father. And so she was there uh, through, you know, through much of the 40s and, and then also in this, you know, part of the 60s and, and, then, and then from roughly the 70s through the early 80s. Okay. Uh, so when we knew her, it, was, it would have been, it, it was from that period from about 75 to the mid 80s. And that's an interesting, that's been an interesting fact um, in kind of in, in organizing this exhibition and trying to understand more about Arledge's life. The, the people that we know that knew her, Terry, Mary, and a few others, um, knew her from that point. You know, so there's all these gaps in her life that we've tried to surmise or um, yeah. yeah, fill in what may well, have happened. Yeah. Well, there's a good lesson for everybody in this room, <laughs> and we learned this lesson the hard way. Uh, when we knew Arledge, of course, we were in our 20s, and we were busy with Film Forum, and that was, we were doing weekly screenings then, and working separate jobs, and, and, and so we weren't really thinking about uh, archival type of work. But what we really uh, regret not doing with Arledge was sitting down with her and doing a comprehensive oral history, mm -hmm. just putting an audio recorder out there and, and having, you know, spending two or three days with her and going over her entire life because there are gaps uh, and things like you were mentioning, maybe in the course of that conversation she would have shared information about meeting this particular artist. So there's a good s s lesson there, and that is that it's never too soon to do these kinds of documentations. And if any of you know artists uh, who you're passionate about, uh, you know, especially if they're older artists, uh, consider the importance of that kind of documentation. You never know when how useful that would be. And I know uh, in the case of Irene, and there's going to also be a book on Arledge that's going to be released this fall, that the Armory's doing, uh, that kind of oral history would have been really helpful in filling in those gaps. Uh, one other story I was going to mention about Arledge, a funny story, one of my favorite anecdotes about her, I forgot I was going to mention it earlier, was when Arledge went up to San Francisco to do the screening of introspection, she uh, did, did tell me that she found a really enthusiastic audience there for experimental film. Mm -hmm. And she was very excited about that. And she even mentioned, she said, that she went into a shoe store. And uh, the clerk in the shoe store asked her what she did for a living. And she said, I'm an experimental filmmaker. And she said the clerk 
said to her, you're an experimental filmmaker? How wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she, that, that reaction by a, a shoe salesman really su surprised her. So. Well, there was a question back here. Yeah, please. Could you say just two more words about what she might have meant by adding time to painting? Uh, well, I, yeah, do you want to, what year? I always want to defer to Terry, <laughs> but I, I mean, I, you know, the, I, I'm trying to remember exactly, she, she wrote about the experience of seeing Thomas Wolford's performance, and she, um, she was really impressed well, what ended up happening was that she was conjuring images of color moving in in ways that the way that she described it, I see, you know, in a sense, rendered in the drawings that she did. Um, she was really critical of Wilfred's um, aesthetic sense. You know, she thought that he was a really poor artist, but that um, but that the the image of this kind of moving um, light as an image was something that she was that she was really inspired by and motivated to somehow try to do. Now the images themselves, as I said earlier, have a great deal of stylistic um, range, and some of them they are some of them are more representational, and many of them are very abstract, and some of them hover somewhere in between. Um, there are images of figures moving. There are images of um, abstract abstractions that, you know, look like voids in space. Um, so you could say that she was maybe rendering images of movement, but I think that she was drawn to the idea of trying to make a painting that moved, honestly. I mean, that's that's kind of the impression I've been left with, and that introspection might be the most, um, the closest to a vision like that, mm -hmm. and um, that the slides were in some sense an effort to do that as well. I mean, it it's it's interesting. It was important to me to include the slides in the exhibition um, on small monitors. You know, it's a very different thing to see them here. And thank you again. It's so great to see this work projected. Um, but it was important for me to see those in the show because the sequence was hers. The, the duration of each image was hers. The way the images, you know, transitioned from one to the next and the sound or lack of it, um, you know, was all her effort to add time to painting, but I'm no, I wonder what you would... I think that's a good description, and I think you're right that introspection was the closest work to trying to capture that, because up until that time, dance was pretty much just a stationary camera set up and filming uh, dance movements. So this was some a way of her of it, to kind of expand that. Uh, and, and so in that particular film you saw using all different kinds of crazy techniques and filming dancers, the, that kind of concave images of the hands and stuff were filmed off, off of a, like a, a hubcap, huh? an mm -hmm. automobile, a Chrysler, uh, I think she said it was a Chrysler hubcap. It had to be Chrysler because they didn't have a logo. It yeah, did, that's so, right. Yeah. yeah, she had to use Chrysler because they didn't have a logo. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> But when I think about the time, her interest in time, I mean, you know, the skeletons, we saw one, we actually saw one twice in two different, um, in two, it appeared twice. But um, that, I mean, there, the narratives in her work are um, evocative, you know, they're not, it's not a um, super descriptive kind of storytelling and, um, but when I think about the time, elements of time in her work through a kind of ambiguous comment like that, there's um, fetal shapes, there's skeletal shapes, you know, there's, there's notions of time represented in, in a number of different ways. And what's interesting about Sari's work is that she's most well known for her, f for the film work, especially uh, introspection and what is a man. Uh, but I, having, uh, seen her work on her last film uh, 
it was a difficult medium for her because she had certain ideas and things that she wanted to put on film that she really wasn't able to do technically and often she would bring people in to assist her camera operators and other people and things just didn't quite work the way she wanted them to to work whereas with her paintings and her slide transparencies those she worked on herself and she had I think they're much more to my way of thinking at least more fully developed mm -hmm. uh, works and her best her best artworks film was a very difficult medium for her uh, and uh, you could even say to some extent all of the films you saw tonight are d are more like vignettes mm -hmm. and, and 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 maybe not even uh, you I mean you, you might not you might, could make an argument that they're not really completely perfectly shaped works. They're more like a series of vignettes. Uh, but nonetheless, her, her, most of her renown came through film and the paintings, which Irene has uh, championed and are on exhibit at uh, 80 of them or so at the Armory Center for the Arts are her, I think her, are, I think her finest work, mm -hmm. th those in the, the slide transparencies. All right, we we'll have more questions. So, yep, there. Yeah, I had a question for Irene. Mean, uh, those slides that she has, are they ever going to be presented again? Well, I, I was able to see them. I saw them in film form, and I saw them at a private showing in uh, Pasadena. And uh, it's some of the strongest work I've ever seen. So it's a shame that they're you're in like a, a prison there and nobody's <laughs> able mm -hmm. to experience it. Yeah, it's, they are pretty spectacular. They're, I mean, as she knew, and as you know, Terry, mm -hmm. they're, they're fragile. And, and, you know, she understood their fragility, which is why she made the films that she did, the four films that we saw. She wanted to get those images out. Um, you know, they're in the collection of the Berkeley Art Museum, and... They, Berkeley has shown them. Uh, that's how I got to, that's when I said earlier that I was just, it was complete serendipity that I was on a day, on, up there on a day that they were testing the projector and the slides. It was because a few weeks later, they were doing a screening in conjunction with a huge ex two-part exhibition that they had up called Way Bay, or yeah, Way Bay. Um, uh, works from their collection all about Bay Area artists and Terry and Mary were up there for the actual formal screening so it's not that they're never shown but they're just you know utterly irreplaceable and um, so be, I beg you your pardon go up there to see them yeah I mean I, I you know I don't I can't really tell you what Berkeley Art Museum's policy is in that way but um, they they were just <coughs> Presenting them at the armory would have created it. It just the, it just wasn't going. It just wasn't possible. And I don't. I'm not aware. It was a massive. Yeah. Yeah. How was yeah, that it modified? Was a, it was a it was a Cal Art Victor projector, and it was probably this wide. And I I was pro I may have very well been projecting those slides when you On saw the them because because yeah. she would usually invite me to come over, and. When you would put the slide in, and the light would go through the slide and project it onto a movie screen, uh, that slide would get very, very hot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was the problem. I pointed that out to her at the beginning because Siri would like to sh you know, show the slide, and then she'd talk about it for five minutes. And I said, Siri, I, I yeah. can't even, when I pull that slide out, I can barely touch it, it's so mm -hmm. hot. And it's actually damaging it could damage yeah. these gels and other mm -hmm. materials. So it was just, even though it was an extraordinary medium, it, the, the fragility of it and the fact that, so I recommended that she not show these for more than 30 seconds to a minute at a time mm -hmm. to preserve them. Now I will say this, uh, the Berkeley Art Museum recently screened, recently had a, uh, a digital, they digitized all of the slides from 1947 to 1950 mm -hmm. And they did a beautiful job. I mean, it's not quite like seeing them, yeah. but they're very, very sharp. And in fact, the Mary and I started a Facebook page for Sarah Arledge uh, just a couple of months ago. And I've been 
uh, they sent me, uh, I, I, we photographed some of the images right off the screen and I've been putting them on the Facebook page. And if you look at them, they're really sharp as digital images, uh, much sharper than the, what you're seeing in the films here. So if you yeah. have, oh I yeah, Mary. I say something to that too because when it went through the projector, the heat created movement mm -hmm. in the form of like the sparkling, undulating feeling that it was just like it was alive and breathing almost. You cannot reproduce that either digitally right. or in a camera film version. When you see it in person, it's like it is alive and it is moving and and kind of breathing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like like it is alive. Yeah, yeah I cannot mm -hmm. experience that yeah. this way. Yeah. yeah, I would not have thought to describe it that way, but it is I was stunned and I'd heard from both of you how stunning these were and you know I just wasn't prepared for really the effect of of feeling how immersive it was even though mm -hmm. you know it's a slide projection we've all seen that in some form or another and you know the light is passing through and casting an image on a wall over there right you're sitting where you are and the image is is on a wall feet away from you but yet it felt extremely immersive it was really a very amazing experience. Will there be scans of some of those slides in the catalog? Uh, there will be, and there are all the slides that um, Terry just referred to are in the exhibition. We have, um, we have, yeah, we have those as well. So those are those are projected, or they're not projected. They're on a monitor, and we also are so lucky about maybe four weeks or so, six weeks, I don't know, before the show opened, mm. Terry and Mary came to the armory and you had just found two slides. It was like, this is, a, this is really great. So we have two, yeah. actually one of them is in one of these. I, I, I didn't register it until oh, seeing it? it here. Yeah, but one of I the two slides um, we saw today. And so we have a little light box with a very low watt bulb and it's very cool, doesn't mm -hmm. heat up. <laughs> and um, we have the two slides sitting on that light box. And, um, yeah, when Mary and I went into the storage unit, we were finally granted access to, to take things out of the storage unit after setting up this trust. We were there for two days, and the, toward the latter part of the second day, we had not seen the slides. Oh. And so we were really freaked out about that, that maybe those were lost. And finally, we found them, and she had stuffed them in a big garbage bag <laughs> inside of... You know the little uh, things that come from the bank that hold the, when you order checks? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. She had stuffed them. She had about, well, there were about over 100 slides and maybe about a d 10 or 12 would fit into each one of those. <laughs> so she had about 10 or 12 of these Bank of America or whatever uh, check boxes <laughs> and they were stuffed inside of those. If, 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 a, if a trash, the trash guy had yeah. come in, those would have just been the first thing thrown into the dumpster. Mm -hmm. So you would so have had that. Interesting. All of those slides would have been lost. So, all right. So at the in the exhibition, there's a photograph of the projector, which is which I took when I was um, what when I when the works were being projected. So you can see what this contraption looks like, but also a box of slides with yes. each slide. And so, so that wasn't hers. No, That's that, the no, that was the way that metal box yeah. that had the slides. That's what she had when she was in Pasadena. I see. And she would set those up in order uh -huh. for me to project them. That's right. So that's the way that's she right. had them. But at yeah. some point, uh, she moved those out of that, because that's what we were looking for. Right. Mm. That, that, that large box that had little compartments for the slides. Right. At some point, she uh, moved those out for some reason, who knows why, put them in these check, maybe for, for transporting, because mm -hmm. maybe they were easier to transport. You mm -hmm. can, you'd have them packed in these boxes, tightly packed in these, but then just toss them into a a, a, right. a, a, a garbage bag, and mm. that's what we found on the last day. And so Crazy. we, needless to say, we really celebrated that night <laughs> when we found those because yeah. that was. Well, let's uh, see if there's 
There's a question there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was really taken by the head titles for all of these films: Chameleon Films, To yeah. Change Is to Continue, with the beautiful color and the background. Yeah. So I'm wondering, uh, maybe two questions. Number one, when did she make that, and and did she? I was wondering if she made that earlier in her career or later in her, in her career. It was put onto the films later. And then second of all, did she envision herself as as having like a little film company, an amateur film company that she was working on? Or how did she conceive of this work? I, I think that that was actually done a little later. Mm -hmm. I, don't believe, I don't believe it was on introspection. No. And uh, I'm, I don't think it was on What is a Man, but it was on all the slide <laughs> films on her last film. So I think that was actually <laughs> something she had done later. Uh, and of course you see the movement of those color slides through there. So I think probably she had, you know, so I, d I don't know, I think, or Mary, do you have a comment? Sin Hak Ga might have helped her with that. Maybe. Yeah, Sin Hak Ga was a, uh, and I know Cindy Kiefer, you know, you know him, uh, he, he passed away, but he was uh, an animator and he had an optical printer and he helped Sari do all the slide films. And he probably helped her create that. Uh, and I don't know that it was so much that she envisioned having a, I mean, some kind of a little company, but she just probably, you know, liked that, having that as a conclusion and liked that the, you know, she was very fond of these brief statements, these short statements. Yeah. So to change is to continue is something <coughs> that would be like, almost like a brief statement to her. Yeah. So, but I think it, it was definitely later. It would have been probably in the, latter part of the 70s <coughs> when she was doing the uh, transparency films that she created that. Do you have one of those transparencies in the exhibition? We have two of them because, right. yeah. yeah. That she used in the titles. Oh, those, yes, yeah. The longer, um, Yep. Yeah, I, I didn't know what those were for, uh, for a while because as I said, I had the, you know, I looked at the works on paper and um, it was a while before I went to before I actually saw the films, I was like, oh, that's what those are. Because so you've got a little tag there that says used in the creation of her head titles. Yeah. That's why I remembered. Well, that. yeah, yes, yes, I surmised that. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know what they were when they were in the that boxes. Makes sense now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we showed those slides. I, I showed them probably at her home a half a dozen times or more to a variety of people, some filmmakers that she knew that came into town and just mm -hmm. friends and, and I, I Everybody that ever, that after we projected those slides, it just uh, it blew everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. People that were were really, you know, never experienced anything quite like that. And of course, she was projecting them in her home, so they were going on a small screen, smaller screen, uh, and even more vivid, and uh, than than on a larger screen like this. So mm -hmm. you'd sit around, and it was just it was. It was quite uh, quite an experience to see, uh, you know. Now I wanted to see if there were a couple people also knew her who potentially had anecdotes about Sarah. I mean, Mary Mary was one of the nymphs in the last. Mary was a well. nymph. Yeah, yeah. Mary was a nymph. <laughs> but and uh, Michael, you both knew her. Did one of you have a. When I was off the hook. Michael. No, no, we're, Michael. We're, Michael we're has pulling a, you back in. Michael has a great story, that. Uh, I. I met Sari at, uh, at Film Four back in the early 80s uh, through Terry. And uh, she even attended one of my film showings over there when Film Four was in Pastina. And she, after the show, she came up to me and she said, I didn't know people were still making films like that. And I didn't know how to take it. I said, geez, I. I better start advancing myself. I'm uh, <laughs> living, living uh, the way pe making films the way people are making them 40 years ago. So she she said, "Oh, so you're a filmmaker, and uh, I'm, I like your films." And then I think Terry later set up a a little project for me to work with her. Uh, she needed a shot of a sunset, so. At the time, she was living at the Livingston Hotel in, in Pasadena, 
and my wife and I went there. Uh, that was the night we were supposed to shoot this sunset. And uh, she, sh she opened up the suitcase and she had all these writings and what looked like astrological charts <laughs> of instructions on how to shoot the sunset <laughs> uh, that she had consulted with, with, I guess so she knew somebody at a lab or something, uh, worked at a film lab. Uh, she knew people you know, might have been, yeah. Yeah. So she said, it's got to be done specifically like this. Has anybody, is anyone familiar with the Weird Taylor story by Robert Block? He's got to make a suit to bring his dead son back to life. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm looking through this and I said, well, in my mind I'm saying, geez, she's got to shoot a sunset, <laughs> open up all the way. She's got slow film. I think she had Kodachrome, which uh, back then had an ASA of 25. Uh, so uh, I said, that's all that I need to know. I don't have to go through this astrological process <laughs> so uh, I didn't tell her that so we we she wanted to shoot this in uh, Poppy Peak which is right next door to Eagle Rock which is where I lived at the time and we're up on Poppy Peak and I'm setting up the uh, tripod with my Bolex and I'm I got the aperture open up all the way because it was really good she wanted it right when just before the sun went went below the horizon line and it's dark at that point and you've got film with asa of 25 so i said okay i'm gonna have to open up the aperture all the way and then maybe shoot it at 12 frames per second which is a slower shutter speed so the film has time to be exposed and she said, no, 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 you, you've got to shoot this at f5.6. I said, f5.6, it's, it's, it's not going to work. It's going to be too black. And my wife will attest to this. And I said, no, no, two eight. And she was insistent that it had to be at f5.6. She was a very stubborn lady. <laughs> uh, so what could I do? I, she was standing right over the lens. Like nothing I could do, so I just made sure that the I set the uh, frames per second at 12 rather than 24 or 18. And when she got the film back, it was black lead. <laughs> <laughs> there was no sunset, and and she went up to Terry and she said, "Who is this guy <laughs> that you recommended to?" shoot this for me it, I can't use it it's all black leader yeah. and uh, I never tell that story unless Terry uh, Terry usually brings it up because you know for me it's a it's a bad memory <laughs> <laughs> but I like the yeah. story because it really uh, Michael's a you know it's a is a very proficient camera operator and it shows uh, this 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 problem she had with the film medium and not quite understanding its its uh, the limitations and, and 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 that there are these things that like this that you the just couldn't do the technical, the, the technical uh, aspect, aspect she yeah. was kind of lost on her yeah. and and so uh, it it was a struggle it was a struggle for her in in all the films and uh, so that I think that's a story that. Uh, you know, so I, I have a. I can't remember how I got this. I, I don't know if she gave it to me that night or maybe Terry gave it to me, but she had an I another idea of shooting a film, and she had like a, I think it was a three or four page script. Uh, I can't remember the title of it, but I remember in it people were jumping out a window from an insane asylum, oh my God. and. I'm going to try to find that. I'd love to see yeah. that. And then, and then I'd I'll love to see that. I'll I'll bring it to you. Yeah. But that was Siri. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One aspect. Yeah. All right. Any other final questions for, or thoughts? Because otherwise we'll. Uh, I mean, I, I know we're all getting ready to go, but uh, we haven't really talked about her being 
a filmmaker in the film world it's been alluded to here but like just the chameleon thing i think it's just part of that film period there was like magic lantern cycle and bruce bailey would have a tag at the beginning just to indicate our mythos so it seems like she's aware of the film world and the, the teaser on the uh, piece of yellow paper we might have read coming in here said contemporary of maya darren now the film of maya darren's that seems very similar is um meditation on violence uh, do you know that one where it's the long shot of the martial arts guy but he's clearly dancing and it's mm -hmm. symmetrical too with this you know mirror imaging thing where it goes and it's all in time where you can't tell really where the cut is where it starts to go in reverse it does the first half and then the second half is just that in reverse mm -hmm. but the time is so fluid and his movements are so fluid you can't really easily tell that it's reversed and um it's late 40s i think mm -hmm. um so do you think she had seen that? Because it seems similar to Invocation. Yes. Uh, I, I think she, she was aware of, de definitely aware of Maya Darren's work. But that's and a dance piece that's so similar to yeah, the Invocation. In the late 40s, uh, Sari taught briefly at the University of Arizona, wrote a, a kind of a early, work p uh, early uh, essay on experimental film, which was published in a journal. And she, I know she screened Darren's films there. And also in 1951, when Maya Darren started uh, a thing called the Creative Film, Found Creative Film Foundation, I think she called it, which was to give a, a grants to up-and-coming filmmakers, she w awarded her first grant to Arledge for the script for What is a Man? And I remember talking to Arledge Seri about that, and there was no money associated with it. It was just... Award. It was just an award, and 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 she met, she met Dar Darren a few times at a, at at a uh, parties in Hollywood, and I don't think, uh, I mean I think she admired Darren's work, but I don't think she got along very well with Darren. Darren was a very different kind of person. Sari was a little more introverted, and Maya Darren was apparently very extroverted. And when she had these parties, she was the life of the party. And I guess Sari didn't get an opportunity to communicate much with her. Um, but they were in direct contact in the 40s. It was when, when Arledge was teaching in Tucson, she would, bar she would um, rent films through, directly through Darren. There was no intermediary, so they were communicating. So it does seem like she's aware of the film world. She wasn't just Yes. Oh, yeah. She was, yeah. she was definitely aware of the film world, and actually... Uh, in the uh, mid to late 70s when we when we you know were screening her work she c was one of the most regular attendees at our film forum programs I mean mm -hmm. she'd come out uh, she'd figure you know hitch a ride with somebody or sometimes Mary and I if we we would pick her up and take her to the screening so she was a regular at the screenings and and kept it correspondence with uh, a few filmmakers of her age uh, there was a filmmaker in New York, Francis Lee, who was a World War II cameraman who did a number of experimental films. Right. She was very fond of those films and of him. So she knew, you know, kept in touch with some filmmakers. Uh, uh, in the exhibition brochure, there's a line uh, at, the, at the gallery, at the armory, there's a line about how she knew Oscar Fischinger and Jules Engel in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And definitely knew the Whitney brothers. Yeah. Uh, they provided her some technical advice on uh, introspection, so she did know and was aware of, of uh, you know, what was happening in the experimental film world of, the, of that time. I mean, introspection precedes meshes. Yes. 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 Oh. Yeah. Yep. Oh, really? Yep. Because mm -hmm. when did meshes come out? Forty-three. Forty-three. Well, Arledge started well, introspection in forty-one, and then her cameraman went off to the war. Uh, her cameraman husband. Her cameraman husband went off to the war, so they, the film was kind of stopped, and then it was picked. They picked up again in '46, oh, so which was the year it was. Yeah. Precisely. It was kind of bracketing that film, uh, and it was uh, released in in '46. Uh, One more. I'm just curious about um, what filmmakers she influenced. Barbara Hammer. People that <laughs> made any comment or mention of her. I mean. I thought it was curious the the uh, what's the man 
sometimes. What is a man? Yeah, what is a man? There was moments that remind me of Spiral Jetty, of going wow. to like that primal place mm. and the images of the salt and sea right. and that, mm -hmm. that scene of the water coming in and out. Yeah. Uh, and then that being a repeated pattern in those slides, mm -hmm. that kind of blending or, or, or bleeding kind of effect going yeah. on. And then of course, I mean, filmmakers like Brackage with working on the film directly. It mm -hmm. seems like that this was really... I don't, I don't know, know the artists much, who were doing uh, that, or the filmmakers. Well, it's hard I, to, I don't know. Besides. I mean, the, her last, both What is a Man and uh, What Do Two Rights Make, to, to me, seem to have relationships to works by Owen Land. Now, whether Owen Land had saw those or came upon them independently, but even the last film of Owen Land, which we screened here, was very much involved with wordplay, with explicit representations of Greek mythical figures, uh, and so on. It's a very odd sort of parallel. You know, work I, as their last works, but I, I, I don't think so. To be quite honest, even though I, it would be it would be wonderful to say, yeah, she inspired. I the the work was so rarely screened. Right. Like I said, when we showed uh, What Is a Man in 1978, it had never been shown publicly in 20 years. Her work just wasn't. Mm screened uh, What Do Two Rights Make? I don't think got any screenings yeah. or exposure outside of Film Forum. So I just don't think that the work was was ever screened to the extent that anybody would have seen it and right. maybe been in. Uh, so I, so if, if there were parallels like you're talking about, I think it's totally just coincidence. Similar interests maybe. Um, I, I think if there was anything that she did that could have had some uh, Im impact, it might have been the it might have been the transparencies because I did rem I do remember reading uh, reading a piece done by one of the light show artists mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s that remembered seeing these slides, these transparencies, and even though the light show art was quite different. I think uh, they mentioned that they thought that was really interesting what she was doing with the glass slide transparency. Mm -hmm. So for all we know, that might have inspired a, uh, a light show artist, but I don't think the films ever uh, had that kind of mm -hmm. uh, reach. Yeah, yeah. reach. It might have been one exception, though. Bill Morris owned a few prints. He did screen them various places. He did screen them in his CalArts classes because yeah. we, have his, we have his archive, as you know. Yeah. And on those syllabi, it does list at least one or two of the films. So he would have screened them over the years to many CalArts students, mm -hmm. and also sometimes when he would go off on tours of Europe and take a full bundle of California films with him. I mean, some screenings here and there by Moritz, I guess. Yeah, I talked to him at one point. I think he was mostly showing introspection, mm -hmm. not what is a man. So introspection definitely of all of her films received the widest exposure, but I'm not, not sure of any filmmakers that were doing anything I mean although who knows I mean that concept th that concept of cine dance which this film was considered a, 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 a forerunner of in the latter part of the 70s and into the 80s there were a lot of filmmakers working with that dance genre we used to screen quite a few of their uh, uh, films at film forum a lot of filmmakers in New York were, were so I mean but I never personally heard them talk about Ireland, so I don't know, but definitely if there was any film that would have, could have possibly inspired a filmmaker, it probably would have been that one just because it had the largest reach. And with that, let's wrap it up here inside at least, but I wanted to thank all of you for coming and for sharing, us, sharing with us all the films of Sarah Catherine Arledge. Thank you, Irene and Terry. And, and thank you on behalf of Arledge, because she would have loved this audience, <laughs> and, and especially to see this many people out. She had a, one of her most famous brief statements was, uh, more people would rather, what was the oh line? Oh, God. M w w the line was, more, more people would, would uh, kill, what, what was the line? Something like they'd rather more, kill themselves More than people would my rather films. kill rather themselves. More people would rather <laughs> kill Kill. Murder, watch my yeah, oh. at least more of them do. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all, and if you haven't made it to the armor yet, please, please make it. Uh, it'll be up for another couple of months. Yes, yeah. two uh, more months. It's actually up through um, May 12th. May 12th. Yeah. May 12th. Thank you all.